Hello class, Professor Dwight Hughes here for Intech 142 Cloud Computing Fundamentals. We're looking at Chapter 2, Business Perspectives. There's three parts to this chapter. Similarities and differences between cloud computing and outsourcing, characteristics of clouds and cloud services from a business perspective, and finally, how the characteristics of cloud computing enhance business value. Let's look at them one by one. From a business perspective, cloud computing is a form of outsourcing. That makes sense, right? I mean, a cloud computing is some other company that you're paying to run your software. You may be paying even to use their software to uh, run your apps or to run uh, your company needs. Outsourcing is contracting with an outside entity to provide a service, right? Like lawn care might be a great analogy. If you mow your own lawn, you're doing that in-house. You probably have the skills to push a mower around your lawn, but if um, you had had the need to do other things, trim the hedges and maybe uh, trim the trees and take care of the roses and it, and it started to get more complex, you might find it's easier just to outsource it, especially if you had to buy a whole bunch of those garden tools. It'd take a while to pay off that investment. So it might be easier to uh, outsource that or outsource uh, parts of that work. You don't have to outsource all the lawn care. Um, I know some of my neighbors in the neighborhood here have gotten a little older. They don't really want to push a lawn more, but they don't mind caring for the roses. So they just pay to have the lawn mowed. Public cloud offerings are usually a one-size-fits-all type of solution. And that's where cloud computing kind of differs from outsourcing. And, and so that's kind of a difference is that public cloud, usually you just have a, a short menu of options. You choose A, B, or C. And outsourcing is typically where it's custom tailored to your business. So outsourcing, you typically come up with a custom contract for what you'll be paying for, where public cloud just more general. Here's a good comparison from the chapter of how they differ. What's different between cloud computing and outsourcing? Well, financial commitment. In cloud computing, it's short term. You could sign up for one day. You could run a server in the cloud for one day on Amazon Cloud and pay for just one day. Also, you pay for what you use, so your usage goes up one day, you pay more, and the next day you pay less. With outsourcing, it's longer term. You sign a year or multi-year contract for a certain amount of capacity and services. Also, if we look at hardware and software assets, you get limited options in the cloud. That's that ABC. You can choose this or that or the other, and that's about it. With outsourcing, you can get tailor-made solutions that meet your specific criteria. Scalability of capacity. It's instantaneous in the public cloud. You need more capacity, it's on demand. It's delivered immediately. If you're outsourcing, you've prepaid in a contract for a certain amount of resources, and to get more requires a renegotiation of the contract, or if it's built in the contract, there's some lead time. It may be 30, 60, or 90 days. Many contracts I work with, there's 90 days lead time. You have to inform them in writing of your need to scale or change, and then they have 90 days to provide that change. Uh, also, cloud computing usually uses a web portal to manage and uh, make these updates and changes to your services. And with outsourcing, it involves contracts and negotiations, so it's not a, uh, a simple process. So those are kind of some differences between cloud computing and outsourcing. Reasons for outsourcing. Well, you may outsource because cloud providers may offer a lower cost per server. They get what's called an economy of scale. If you or I buy a server, I mean, they're paying a little less for their servers because they buy 100 at a time. So if you buy 100 of those servers, the manufacturer is going to cut you a better deal than you or I would get. Plus, if we buy a server, we have some physical requirements. We have to provide a certain amount of power and cooling and security, um, some redundancy, like redundant power, like batteries, and maybe redundant internet. And so if you're only running a few servers, that could be really expensive on a per-server basis. Again, they benefit from that economy of scale. 
where if they have hundreds of servers, you know, it's, it's really not that much more to add a little more air conditioning, a little more power, because they already have those uh, resources in place. Also, managing servers may be easier in the cloud, but like we mentioned, being able to, you know, click on a, click on a web browser and manage it there versus um, having to manage your own servers, which uh, you might have to hook up a monitor and a keyboard and go through all kinds of things to get into each server and manage it. Also, server procurement and provisioning. Procurement is the purchasing of servers and provisioning. I, I purchased some uh, LAN switches about two, three weeks ago, and they're expected to arrive here in June. There's, uh, because of COVID-19, a lot of um, backups in the supply chains. So procurement and provisioning is time consuming. It takes a long time. So for companies that have in-demand needs, they need that extra capacity now. Cloud is going to be a better source for them than waiting around for servers and other network equipment to arrive, which after it arrives, you then have to provision it, which means set it up. You have to test it. Occasionally get one that's bad, we call it, you know, DOA, dead on arrival. So that lengthens the time. You have to call them, do what's called an RMA, uh, return merchandise authorization. You get a number, they ship you a new one. The, these are all part of the problems of purchasing your own equipment and getting it installed and set up. It is very time consuming. And you should expect a, a long uh, time before the equipment is in, in service and in production. External service providers may provide access to innovative software solutions or platforms. Oftentimes, because of their economy of scale, they can hire their own custom programmers that write software that only works on their, on their system and is pretty slick. They have some nice web interfaces that would allow you to do things that there's no software really written to do on, on our internal servers. So there's a lot of innovative software perhaps available through these cloud service providers to allow you to more effectively manage um, your resources in the cloud. Now, not owning large data centers reduces your capital expenditures, right? It costs money. Capital expenditures are money. And if you were to buy a bunch of servers and switches and network gear, you have to write big checks up front. I mean, no one's going to send you that stuff without payment. So you're going to probably have to take lines of credit, go to a bank, borrow money to be able to purchase all this equipment. You may have to hire electricians and uh, HVAC people to put the air conditioners in. So you may have to make some building modifications. Again, that could be, you know, expensive. And so there's a lot of upfront costs with owning your own large data center, even the ongoing maintenance. From the day you buy servers, they're already aging. And when they get between seven and 10 years old, they start to be a little unreliable. And it becomes inefficient to run them any longer because they use a lot more power than newer servers and power costs money and they generate a lot more heat than newer servers. So you're paying more for air conditioning and newer servers are smaller and more powerful because they keep getting smaller and more powerful. So you have to look at replacing them down the road and that's an additional cost you have to factor into owning a large data center is the eventual replacement of all the computer equipment you purchased to put in there. Again, with the cloud, you got none of those worries. You're renting. It's like renting a house versus owning a house. I own a house now and when I was younger, I rented for many years. And I miss some of the simplicity about just writing a check every month. I don't have to worry about the roof leaking. That's the, the landlord's responsibility. I don't have to worry about the foundation cracking or the house needing repainting. That, again, is not the renter's responsibility. It's all taken care of. I just pay my, my fee, and it's real easy for me to budget that. When you're a homeowner, you have all kinds of unexpected um, expenses that you have to be able to budget for and owning a data center is similar. Let's look at some common traits. So if you want to use cloud computing and outsourcing, you probably have a lack of internal skill set. So one big reason that we outsource things is we don't have the skilled technicians on our staff to do that kind of work. Or you have them, but they're so busy doing other things for your company that it makes sense to outsource or use cloud computing for that. So a lack of internal skill set, a lack of human beings that are on your payroll that could do that work. 
like building you a data center, maintaining and running that data center, troubleshooting and doing all those aspects. If you don't have a big staff of people, you're probably a good candidate for cloud computing. Provider owned assets, and we talked about this one in the last slide. You don't have to own much if you're using cloud. So they're owned by the provider. The cloud is called the provider, right? And so the provider, they have to buy and own all those and maintain them and update them. And you're just paying to use them. You're just renting. Vendor lock-in potential. Now that's a negative and that is a common trait of cloud and uh, outsourcing there is that they often have proprietary tools and formats to their cloud that prevent you from easily moving your things back out of their cloud if you are dissatisfied and moving them into someone else's cloud, for example. Now that's slowly changing in our industry and we're developing some standards. We have companies like uh, Amazon and Microsoft and VMware that have agreed to work together on common standards that allow uh, virtual machines and um, devices and, and software that runs on one cloud to almost seamlessly move to their competitor's cloud. And that's because customers are demanding that. They don't like vendor lock-in. Vendor lock-in means the longer you're with a vendor, the less likely you can ever leave that vendor and go to someone else. And so that's usually seen as a warning sign to companies. It's something to be cautious about, certainly at the beginning when you're deciding uh, whether to do cloud computing, is if you change your mind, how easy is it to get things back on your own equipment? The next section, characteristics of clouds and cloud services from a business perspective, capacity client. Uh, planning. We want to do capacity planning so that we can uh, be ready for growth. So we have to plan and there's what we looked at in chapter two, IAAS, PAAS, and SAAS. So with IAAS, remember that's infrastructure as a service, we'd be looking at things like CPU, storage, RAM, and in the cloud these can be provisioned and released rapidly. So like I say, you only pay for what you use. So if all of a sudden you need 16 CPUs, you got them. And then if you only need four later, you drop back down and you only pay for the period of time you were using the 16. Uh, or platform as a service. Application libraries are easily reused because they're in the cloud. So they're available to all of your applications all the time. Instead of being stuck on one server or another, they're easily uh, available throughout all the cloud that you're purchasing. And then SaaS, software as a service, you can add and remove your users on short notice with few penalties. So for instance, say you're paying for 10 users and now you want 50, you can just start adding more users and they just start charging you for the next tier. That may not be exactly 50, it may be 10, 15, 100. Right, so if you have 50, you may have to pay for 100. They they have uh, they don't often have it per user. They do at the very bottom. You pay for one, two, three, and then once you get up to like five, then six users, it's the same to have 10 things like that. So there is a grouping of costs just to keep it simple. They will have some some levels of uh, of that. So those are things to keep in mind with capacity planning it's easier in the cloud is what what we're saying is you can budget much easier you can look at what they're charging at different levels and decide your uh, needs and growth around what fits with your budget confidentiality that's a type of security and for confidentiality in the cloud we mean encryption and encryption takes one of two forms we encrypt things when they're moving across a wire called network encryption and what's the predominant protocol we use to encrypt things when they're moving? In the cloud world, it's HTTPS or um, secure web, right? And that's what your bank and Facebook and all these secure websites use with the little padlock icon you may see over in the URL is um, HTTPS. But in general, it's encrypted traffic so that what you're sending to and from the server can't be spied on by others. And the other would be stored data. And stored data, your data has to be stored somewhere in the cloud on some server. And so we also want to encrypt it there. And a lot of cloud providers will offer 
a customer specific key that only you have that they don't have. Not all do, but that's something to look for when you're um, looking at cloud providers is, is the data you store there encrypted and is it encrypted so that only you can see it? Um, most customers don't even want their cloud provider to be able to look at their data and actually they may not be able to for legal reasons like if you're a bank or a hospital or a school we're required to keep confidentiality of student records patient records and that sort of thing and so in order to maintain that we have to ensure we're the only ones that can look at that data so we would need that type of stored data encryption another type of security is integrity Integrity means the data you're looking at was unaltered. No one tampered with it. So that would be the integrity. And a good analogy, if you remember some movies in the past, maybe they had a king and the king would put his ring in some hot wax and put that hot wax seal on an envelope. And that was a way to put integrity on what was in the envelope. That meant if you got the letter from the king, you looked for the seal. And if the seal was broken, the integrity had been broken, meaning that someone had at least looked at that data, but it may also have been altered. So the seal on the envelope was the integrity. That would be a, an example of integrity. Now we talk about availability. Another type of security is availability. And what we mean by that is, is your data in more than one place? Your data shouldn't just be one place, or what if that one place, what if the internet goes down in that one place, or, um, other types of denial of service attack or something is happening in that one locale, you want to have your data in at least two places. So you want to replicate your data. So is your data replicated? And you pay the more places you have your data replicated. So when you purchase cloud, you can choose to have it stored in just one data center. That would be low availability. Or if you choose higher availability, you may choose to have your data duplicated to two or three or more data centers around the world so that it increases the likelihood that your data will always be available, always, all the time. Finally, we look at how the characteristics of cloud computing enhance the business value. Let's look at hardware independence and variable cost. So we've said this before, hardware independence, you don't have to buy your own hardware. So that's pretty freeing. You don't have to buy a room to keep the hardware in and people to maintain the hardware. And so you're paying someone else to do all that. Obviously, someone else had to buy a room. They have to hire people and they're the cloud provider, right? So the cloud provider can deliver lower costs because they get that economies of scale. That's kind of the key word here for this chapter. Clients don't have to purchase large amounts of hardware. Instead, they just rent what they need. Distribution over the internet. So that's another important difference is that you can access it from anywhere. You don't have to come into work to get to your data. It's not trapped on a network that's inside the walls of your company. It's available anywhere you can get the internet. So public cloud is available from any device, anytime, anywhere in the world that has internet connection. We've had that for quite a while. I want to remind you that although cloud is pretty cool because that is the case with cloud, uh, we did have something that allowed our private networks, our networks in our companies to be available like that wherever we went. And that was called a virtual private network or VPN. They've been around for years and it's an encrypted tunnel across the internet to your company's network. And that would allow you to work from home or a coffee shop or wherever you may be. And so that's existed for a long time, but they usually have complicated setups, specialized software and hardware that has to be purchased and configured. So you have to hire people to maintain and um, provide support for that uh, versus just using the web browser, which is typical with the public cloud. My final thought for this chapter is economies of scale. Cloud computing is essentially economies of scale. You're taking advantage of being able to buy in bulk, right? I used to belong when I was young to a club of people that bought vegetables and the, the group would go to farms and buy huge amounts of vegetables and then bring them in to this um, place on Saturday and divvy them up. So we all paid money into a pot 
of money and they went and bought the vegetables in bulk right from the farm and then we would get our bag of vegetables every saturday at a very low cost like five dollars for a bag of vegetables and so it was um a co-op a buying co-op and so those have been around, around a long time that's essentially what cloud computing is is you're buying your computing resources by throwing your money in with other customers and the cloud provider is using that money to buy and maintain the equipment that they're um, running to you.